keynote speaker is Associate Professor Ian Blair, and he's very well recognised as Australia's foremost authority on the genetics of motorian disease. His seminal research, which is featured in the 25 million 25 milestones uh, booklet, um, uh, highlights uh, uh, starts well not starts but uh, Ian's uh, foundational uh, contribution was uh, as joint first author of a science paper that uh, was in 2008 and uh, which was identifying mutations in the TDP43 gene and showing definitively that role in motor neuron disease and that has underpinned a lot of the research that's going on today and, and indeed we'll hear about today. Ian was a Bill Gold Fellow in 2006 and in 2013 he was awarded the MND Australia Leadership Award. Today Ian is the Centre Director of the Macquarie University Centre for Motor Neuron Disease Research. He heads up a research group there which is investigating a broad range of molecular and cellular bases of motor neuron disease. And he is continuing to be involved in many of the new uh, genetic discoveries that are going on in Australia so, uh, and internationally. And so it's my great pleasure to invite Ian to give our keynote address. Great. Right. Well, thank you, Naomi. That was a very kind introduction and a very inspiring opening to this meeting. I'm very glad that genetics gets to lead this off. I know we're going to hear about uh, 30 years of, of research, advances in research in MD. Hopefully, you get a sense of that as the day goes on. But I like to think that genetics has really led the way in our understanding of MD. And not just the, the gene discoveries themselves, they've implicated a lot of the molecular mechanisms that are involved, but they have been a catalyst to a lot of the. Uh, in vitro and vivo studies that are underway that also have a significant impact on um, clinical practice as well. So I'm going to go right back where really dark and dim understanding of the disease, right back to when Charcot first described um, MD as a clinical entity and of course he coined the, the phrase amyotrophic lateral sclerosis as uh, his based on his observations of pathology and that I will use that, for, uh, that term ALS as we move through the talk. But at, in that uh, first description, he made no mention of familial inheritance, nor of the mental symptoms. So that gave us some, some insight into some of the challenges we would have for genetic studies. Obviously, familial inheritance wasn't obvious or apparent at the time. And it wasn't until some 15 years later that Osler um, described a family from Vermont in the US, a particularly large family that had uh, a high incidence of what we now call a high penetrance of um, ALS. And in that Told us that, that told us right from the outset that though that high incidence, those high incidence families, the highly penetrant ALS is particularly rare. And in fact, today we know it's really largely uh, restricted to SOD1. And it wasn't another nine, ten years, another ten years later that these two neurologists, actually say clinicians, I think a psychiatrist recognised that there were mental symptoms, that in a proportion of cases there was, they described the late onset psychosis together with uh, paralysis and pro progressive aphasia as well. Now fast forward to uh, MN when MNDRAA awarded its very first grant, whether it was called the grant in aid, I don't know, but it, it was a grant in aid, okay, the very first grant in aid award in, in 1987. But at that time, no genetic loci had been identified, no ALS genes had been identified. Didn't that. Well, it's to the, now we're going to focus on the last 30 years. And things were looking brighter, not least because in 1988, the ubiquitinated inclusions that are the hallmark, that we know as the hallmark pathology, were first described, here described as a new neuronal inclusion. Um, 
And it was only a, a few years later that the first genetic locus was mapped, and two years later, uh, the gene mutations in SOD1 were identified. And they're identified in that first family that Osla described back in 1880, that family from Vermont, the A4V mutation. I, uh, I highlight our own Nigel Langarth and, and Janet Nash here because they played a key role right from the outset here. Um, Garth is a, a, a co-author on that first paper, Nigel a co-author on that second paper, and of course we just heard Janet was working alongside Garth recruiting a lot of these families for the genetic studies and, the, and, and they played a role in some of the seminal genetic studies that followed and that at indeed some part of our discovery cohort today. Many are yet to be solved. So, keeping in mind that it took 113 years from when Osler first described that first, that family from Vermont, constantly studying, recruiting, ascertaining that family studies. It took 113 years to identify the first gene. And remember, slot one is the only highly penetrant, largely the only highly penetrant. So, in that context, you'd have to either be brave or stupid or naive to say, I think you've got to make a, a career in hunting ALS genes. But we were, had some, what, some luck on our side despite the lack of progress. What, what drove the lack of progress in ALS gene discovery relative to other diseases? You'll see other diseases were rapidly publishing and identifying new genes. And the Mendelian inheritance of man became the online Mendelian inheritance of man was, was growing exponentially the number of disease genes that were being identified and published. Well, the limitations are, are, are due to the characteristics of, of the disease, the fact that it is late onset, the particular variability in the onset of the disease and the progression of the disease. And the fact that non-SOD1 families show usually reduced penetrance of, of the disease. Some mutation carriers do not develop the disease. But nevertheless, we, we had some luck on our side and, and we did identify the next gene. And that came about from the discovery of another large US family from Maryland. And I was fortunate enough to be part of a, a talented team at the University of Washington that were mapping mapping genes and in, in 2000 we ma managed to map the, the locus for this family to a very small interval of chromosome 9 and then a few years later identify mutations in Sanitaxin for a form of ALS that's called, uh, it's an ad adolescent onset form, called, in other words, uh, juvenile ALS. That was, that was exciting but no matter how hard we looked we could not find mutations in the classic form. Of, of ALS. So really, we were chipping away at the edges. Nevertheless, it, it only took, after 113 years, it only took 11 years to get to the next one. So things were looking, looking brighter. And of course, in 2006, we had this report after uh, the initial discovery of the ubiquitinated hallmark, ubiquitinated inclusions in 88. Now we recognise in 2006, Manuel Neumann and colleagues, reported that TP43 was one of those ubiquitinated proteins. That was exciting, but it, it, like any good discovery, it, it leads to a lot, a lot of additional questions. So if we were to look at one of these inclusions, we knew that they were ubiquitinated. And within those inclusions, we knew that there were numerous proteins, a few of which we knew, most of which we didn't. Now we had a new one identified, TDP43. But of course, if there's multiple proteins in there, which are the key proteins? So the question obviously is, is misfolded TDP43 a cause playing a pathogenic role or is it just caught up as a consequence of the disease that may or may not be playing a role in the progression of the disease? And we answered that clearly with genetics. And two independent lines of evidence looking for mutations and also independently looking for genome-wide linkage analysis. There's no a prior hypothesis there. You just go and say, let's look at the whole genome and see if we can map the gene. And we did that. And we did that in Australian families. 
and this is a, a, a large family that, that had been recruited by Garth, Garth Nicholson, who's from Brisbane. And we genome-wide linkage analysis identified a single peak on the short arm of chromosome 1, and under that peak lay TARP BP, which encodes TDB43. <laughs> and of course, we went on and identified various mutations um, in Australian families and UK families as well. Um, M337V was from the Brisbane family. I'm also going to highlight their Q331K, which we identified in a sporadic case. That's quite a profound observation that we've identified mutations in familial and sporadic disease. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The pathology. We went, <coughs> while well, it had been recognised by Manuel Neumann and, and subsequent studies that there was the TDP43 pathology in most sporadic cases, it hadn't been identified or recognised broadly in familial disease. And we were able to demonstrate that regardless of mutation, with the exception of SOG1, regardless of the mutation in the families, we didn't know the mutation, they still had TDP43 pathology. So you'll see a pattern here. Things are speeding up. Things are hotting up. We're finding more and more genes. And of course, based on the function of, of T43, as an RNA binding protein, FUS was a hot functional candidate gene. And these are, again, Australian families where we identified mutations in FUS. And in that very large family, again, we had independent linkage analysis genome-wide. Um, R521H and R521C mutations identified in those families. And then, of course, the functional, the, the role as RNA binding proteins, now we've got two, is, let's do the bleeding obvious. And so let's go and screen as many RNA binding proteins as we can. And that's what we did. And yeah, this was a collaboration with Aaron Gidler, where we were able to identify mutations in other RNA binding proteins. So they came out rapidly, one after another. So things, again, hotting up with the genetic discoveries are getting faster and faster. And then they really started to fall out. So, and here I'm going to focus on the, the link between ALS and frontotemporal dementia, FTD. And it was in 2010 we reported a family that had a fuss mutation that uh, that presented with ALS or FTD. And then in 2011, of course, we had the reports of Bitcoin 2 in ALS and FTD families. And then the C9 or 72 expansions, again, as now the most common known cause of ALS and FTD. TBK1, similarly, ALS and FTD, and our most recent discovery, CCNF mutations um, in both in ALS and FTD. So we can go back to what those clinicians first described over a century ago was now being borne out in modern molecular data. And we really consider it as a spectrum, a spectrum of disease. At each end, we have pure forms, <coughs> pure ALS, SOD1 pathology, pure FTD with tau pathology. And the majority of ALS and FTD cases having this T43 proteinopathy. And I've mapped on uh, the majority of, of genes that have been identified. I've tried to plot them roughly along that spectrum. But I want to particularly highlight is these are, these are, these are the gene discoveries worldwide. All of those in red have been funded, at least in part, by MNDRA, and I think that's quite remarkable. So where do we stand today? And this is from Emily McCann, a PhD student here, who will be wandering around with the microphone in a minute, um, who surveyed over 200 Australian families and looked at the distribution of mutations. Of course, C9 off 72, we see there is over 40%. What I want to particularly highlight is that black hole, 39.2%. Despite the rapid advances in, in gene discoveries, 
we still have this massive black hole that needs to be solved. How are we going to solve, solve that and why is there such, still so many to be solved? It comes back to one of the characteristics of the disease. We arbitrarily assign familial and sporadic as a means of uh, helping out research, regardless of what type of research. It really is a false dichotomy. And really, what we're looking at is the spectrum from the highly penetrant disease, or the nearly inheritance, and that's largely limited to SOD1, right through to sporadic. The vast majority have reduced penetrance, and there is a blur between familial and sporadic disease. And the great example of that is C9L72. We now have a, a, a molecule that's responsible for a significant number of cases, and we can look, and then up to 10% of sporadic cases have, and this is data from uh, uh, that Kelly Williams put together for um, in Australian ALS cases, familial and sporadic, significant proportion of sporadic cases have seen on all 72 expansions. And that's far more than can be explained by unrecognised familial inheritance. We go back to the original TDP43 discovery. It was in familial and sporadic ALS. Same with FUS, familial and sporadic. BCP, sequestered zone, and our most recent CCNF, all identified familial and sporadic disease. So it highlights that we are looking, these are all rare variants that are not present in the general population, largely, that can be highly penetrant, cause highly penetrant disease, or graduate right through, or all act as risk alleles with low penetrance. And it highlights the importance of genetic background where the genetic and epigenetic um, factors can act as risk alleles or modifiers. So there's a real challenge in trying to solve, that's what we call a complex genetic architecture. So there's a real challenge in trying to solve, solve that. And some of the strategies we're trying to do requires very large sample sizes. Sample sizes on a much larger scale in Australia to just contribute, but on an international scale. And this is the, the SALSA consortium, which was been initiated by our chair, Naomi Ray, and, and largely driven by um, Andrew Henders, over here, where there is coordination upon, amongst the major metropolitan MND clinics to coordinate recruitment of patients, um, coordinated uh, management of clinical data, and coordinated genetic studies. And also, is known as Project Mind. We are part of this, what is called a human, we call a human genome project for ALS. The goal is to sequence the whole genomes of 15,000 ALS patients and identify those variants across this full spectrum from the high, the, the highly penetrant, the intermediate, and low penetrant variants contribute to, to ALS. Uh, MNDRAA uh, had the foresight to uh, award us a grant in aid to launch Australia's role, a grant to um, Matthew Keenan and myself to, to sequence the first 35 genomes and we were able to use that to leverage NHMRC to provide us another $1.3 million to sequence now. We've sequenced 650 Australian genomes. They have <coughs> Uh, are progressively being fed into Project Mine, and Project Mine is already starting to generate data in a very short time. There is no near 15,000 yet, but is already starting to um, identify some of those risk alleles with the, the modest, the modest effect responsible for uh, ALS along the, that spectrum. I'm just going to highlight a couple of the, the top hits. The top hits that came out in the last year, NEC1 and C21 or 2, because they are implicating what seems to be a new mechanism underlying, the primary mechanism underlying motor neuron death, and that is DNA damage. So what have we learned from 
the ALS and FTD genes today, they largely fall under three categories. They're not mutually exclusive. RNA metabolism, protein clearance pathways, and now DNA damage repair. Not mutually exclusive, you'll see that some of the molecules overlap. Not least because we know that uh, RNA binding proteins critically regulate DNA damage repair similar, similarly for the protein clearance pathways. So identifying some of the primary molecular and cellular mechanisms offers now hope uh, for biomarker discovery and therapeutic development. So what are some of the immediate short-term uh, outcomes, benefits for clinical practice and for patients? Clinical genetics, we can offer symptomatic testing. When I started, we were only able to give an answer in less than 15% of familial patients and no sporadic cases. Today we can give an answer somewhere between 60 and 65 percent of familial cases and perhaps up to 10 percent of sporadic cases. A, a profound impact on genetic counselling too, particularly for purposes of, of reproductive choices and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis combined with IVF. And I'm just going to touch some on some of those genetic counselling, profound implications for genetic counselling. And this is some work from Ashley Crook, a uh, senior genetic counsellor with our clinic at uh, Macquarie Neurology. Just some of the points, are gonna, some of the barriers of facilitators to test. A facilitator, for example, is a particular interest, a desire to participate in research. But that can also can be a, a barrier because, say, I don't need to know, I've always known about the disease. Also, a, a facilitator can be the desire to inform your children, particularly for reproductive choices. That also can be a, a barrier, because wishing to avoid the guilt of knowing that you have passed on a variant, a pathogenic variant, to a child. Also, a, a facilitator may informing um, what may alter your life priorities, but that can be a barrier to not wanting to have that knowledge influence how you live your life. So the mutation discoveries have provided the tools to this profound implications for clinical practice, but they've provided the tools for much of the, the in vitro and in vivo studies that are going to be described today. They are, provide the tools for generating the cell and animal models. I've talked about diagnostic tests, disease models, and they tools can be used to tease out disease mechanisms and be the, the, the tools for therapeutic discovery. So, so to wrap up, so 30 years of genetic data has told us that ALS is a complex multi-system disease. The, there is this false dichotomy between familial and sporadic disease. We're looking at rare variants of variable penetrance. It's a highly modifiable disease from genetic and epigenetic and environmental modification, modifiers. There is the ALS and FTD continuum. The gene discoveries have implicated a variety of primary molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying the disease and still other mechanisms play a role in disease progression. So solving that complexity requires not just single discipline research but multidisciplinary research, perhaps a, a team's approach, a partnership approach to trying to understand the disease and this is where I'll, I'll try and give you an example of what we are trying to do at Macquarie University is to initiate multidisciplinary research by bringing experts together in each of those disciplines, putting them under the one roof and saying, okay, collaborate. Collaborate, bring your expertise across disciplines to see if we can solve this disease. And that brings me then just to acknowledge there's a heck of a lot of people here involved um, at Macquarie University um, and one thing I just wanted to highlight here is that the number of people here, this is only sort of touching on the number of people involved. Our latest discovery, CCNF, was a, a, a paper that had 
involved 34 institutions where the genetics requires very uh, large numbers of uh, patients in order to get the power. So, there was, so that, that was led by Macquarie. And then we had the functional consequences of those variants. So we, were, we obviously uh, multidisciplinary research with the cell biology, the molecular profiling, and Justin Justin did much of that work, along with Albert Lee. Um, and now we have cell, uh, sorry, it's an animal modeling, we have zebrafish models and mouse models that represent those mutations. So I'm going to leave it there um, and just highlight that these, this, much of this work was um, supported by Peter Stern Familial M&D Research Grants, Grant in AIDS, and the M&D Australia Leadership Grant. So thank you.